Is it really worth it to purchase and recycle lithium ion cells from old laptop batteries? Welcome back everyone to another fascinating video. In this series, I will delve deeply into this question, taking a detailed look at all the relevant factors involved. Given the complexity of the topic, I've decided to break it down into two or three distinct videos. This way, I can present the information in a way that's easier to digest for viewers. To kick off this project, I collaborated with a friend who works as a laptop technician. He kindly supplied me with a collection of old laptop batteries, roughly 20 to 25 in total. At first glance, the dust accumulation on these batteries hinted at their age, but what truly mattered was how they had been stored. Fortunately, they were kept in a cool environment, shielding them from heat, one of the main culprits known to compromise the integrity of lithium-ion cells. Upon examining these battery packs, I was initially concerned because none of them came from the same laptop models. While some batteries originated from the same manufacturer, they belonged to different laptop designs that were produced in various years. On a positive note, most laptop manufacturers tend to stick with lithium-ion cells sourced from a handful of primary brands, namely LG, Sony, Samsung, Sanyo and Panasonic. However, a closer inspection revealed that several of these packs were actually replacement batteries meant to substitute damaged original packs. The unfortunate reality is that these replacement packs predominantly house unbranded lithium-ion cells sourced from Chinese manufacturers. One revelation I wasn't aware of before starting this project is that some of these Chinese replacement packs contain lithium polymer cells instead of traditional lithium-ion cells. This is a crucial point for anyone interested in harvesting lithium-ion cells. Disassembling packs that contain lipo cells requires extreme caution Puncturing these cells can lead to serious fire hazards. The encasements of these batteries are typically glued shut, requiring a considerable amount of force to open them safely. If you're not vigilant, you could inadvertently create a dangerous situation for yourself. Since I had no plans to reuse the LiPo cells, I took this as an opportunity to demonstrate how to dispose of them safely. The process is relatively straightforward, immersing the cells in a container filled with a generous amount of salt for 24 hours seemed to be a viable option. However, I must clarify that this isn't the most effective method. A more efficient way to ensure lipo cells are fully discharged is to connect a resistor that can handle the power output across the two terminals or use a small light bulb or a modern charger equipped with a discharge function. In my situation, soaking them was the most practical choice due to how the cells were interconnected and the sheer volume I was dealing with. When setting out to harvest laptop battery cells, it's essential to remember that you are likely to encounter some cells that are completely damaged. In these instances, it appears that high humidity was the main factor leading to corrosion, which gives the affected cells a peculiar appearance, almost as if they were suffering from a skin condition. While this may not necessarily be a sign of poor storage practices, it's plausible that the laptop's owner might have accidentally dropped it in water. That said, I remain open to other explanations so please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. A word of caution. Avoid the mistake I made by using latex gloves, as they can lead to cuts from the sharp edges of the plastic casings. Instead, it's wise to invest in heavy-duty gloves to safeguard your hands from potential injuries. Eye protection is also crucial, given that plastic shards can become airborne during the disassembly. I strongly recommend using medical isolation eye shields as they offer robust protection for your eyes. I found that the easiest way to pry open these plastic enclosures was to start at the charging port, which is typically the weakest point. However, it's imperative that you avoid using any sharp or metallic tools for this task, 
as they can easily puncture lipo cells and provoke a fire. I dedicated nearly a full day to this endeavor, but grew increasingly frustrated with the process. Please heed my advice. Don't emulate my actions. It's better to follow the safety guidelines rather than risk creating a hazardous scenario. After two arduous days of dealing with minor cuts and suffering from finger cramps, I successfully harvested close to 120 cells. Keep that number in mind, as it will be instrumental in addressing the question of whether it's worth it to purchase and recycle lithium-ion cells from old laptop batteries. There was a moment when I almost threw in the towel midway through the harvesting process due to the sheer volume of work involved. It was now the third consecutive day and the task felt tedious and unending. Nevertheless, my determination to answer the overarching question kept me going strong. On the third day, I tackled the hassle of removing the stubborn nickel strips that connected the cells. I can't help but wonder if I'm simply slow or not efficient enough in this task. If you've undertaken a similar project, I'd love to hear your experiences and tips. By the end of the fourth day, I finally concluded my hard work, so I thought to myself, and I was left with a total of 18 different brands of lithium ion cells. The next step in my process was to categorize the lithium ion cells into two distinct groups based on their voltage readings. I created one group for cells with a voltage reading below 2 volts and another for those with a voltage reading above 2 volts. Cells that register voltages below 2 volts are considered to be over-discharged, which poses a risk for damage. While it is indeed possible to attempt to restore these cells to a functional state, it is important to note that there is a significant likelihood they may already be impaired in some way. To carry out this categorization effectively, I initially relied on a multimeter for precise voltage readings. However, I discovered that there is a much simpler and faster alternative, using economical single-cell chargers. The operational lights on these chargers serve as indicators. If the lights do not illuminate, it suggests that the cell's voltage is below 2 volts. Conversely, if all the indicator lights turn green, it signals that the cell's voltage is above the crucial 2 volt threshold. During this sorting process, I had to dispose of approximately 30 cells that were physically damaged or that showed a reading of 0.00 volts, indicative of a failed battery. Following this initial screening, I found that I was left with fewer than 100 cells that appeared to be usable, though my concern remained regarding the group of cells with voltages below 2 volts. The subsequent phase of my process involved charging these underperforming cells to a target voltage above 3 volts. Once I was able to achieve this, I meticulously recorded the voltage of each individual cell. After charging, the cells were stored for a duration of 72 hours. This storage period was crucial, as it allowed me to check the voltage again and see if any cells experienced a significant drop in voltage, which can be a telltale sign of underlying issues. Once the three-day mark was reached, I began my evaluation of the voltage stability. I was pleased to observe that the majority, if not all, of the cells manufactured in Japan passed this assessment with remarkable results, displaying a minimal voltage drop of only 0.01 or 0.02 volts. The South Korean cells also exhibited commendable performance during this test. However, it was disappointing to find that most of the cells that did not pass this evaluation were sourced from China, suggesting a variance in quality. At this stage, I currently have fewer than 80 cells remaining, which I consider to be within an acceptable range for further testing. Yet, my work is far from complete. These cells still require thorough checks for their internal resistance and capacity to be deemed suitable for practical application. Given the extensive amount of information involved in this project, I hope you can understand why I need to divide this video into two parts. 
The wealth of details might overwhelm some viewers, so it seems prudent to conclude the first part here and continue the discussion in the next video. In part 2, I will focus on checking the capacity and internal resistance of each remaining cell. I assure you that I will be conducting these checks without relying on the expensive machinery typically associated with cell analysis, making this project accessible to everyone interested in similar pursuits. To ensure you don't miss part 2, I encourage you to subscribe and hit the notification bell. If you found this part 1 educational and engaging, please consider liking the video as well. Thank you for sticking with me until the very end.